Forget frequently asked questions. Common sense, common knowledge, or Google. How about advice from a real genius? 95% of people in any profession are good enough to be qualified and licensed. 5% go above and beyond. They become very good at what they do, but only 0.1%. A real Jesus. Richard Jacobs has made it his life's mission to find them for you. He hunts down and interviews geniuses in every field. Sleep science, cancer, stem cells, ketogenic diets, and more. Here come the geniuses. This is the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Before we begin, a note from our sponsor. I'm Richard Jacobs, Executive Director of the nonprofit Finding Genius Foundation and host of the Finding Genius Podcast. In late 2016, I was rear-ended at 65 miles an hour by a truck on the highway, which sent me off-road into a ditch. The impact of the collision gave me a concussion and other injuries. At the hospital, a CT scan showed that I had thyroid nodules, which turned out to be cancer. It was then, when I had a biopsy in my neck, that I realized, even if I was a millionaire, I wouldn't want a second or a third biopsy due to the pain and the invasiveness of it. And appointments at that time for thyroid experts were three to six months out. And I was worried about dying now, even if that was irrational. So because of this, I've decided to raise money to conduct a literature review on steroids, on the causes of anxiety and depression, a condition that affects well over 50 million people in the United States and hundreds of millions worldwide. Our goal is to create a codex, a guide that reveals all possible treatments for anxiety and depression for people that live with the condition or for loved ones that have it, as my wife and my son do. To find out more about our fundraiser, visit FindingGeniusFoundation.org and click on Current Initiatives. And now, to our guest. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Finding Genius Podcast, now part of the Finding Genius Foundation. I have uh, Leonardo Alvarez. He's the CEO of a company called Proterra. And we're going to talk about his work on algorithms that calculate uh, amino acid combinations and simulate proteins. So, Leonardo, thanks for coming. Hi, Richard. Thank you very much for the invitation. Very excited to, to be here today. Oh, good. If you would tell me about uh, Proterra, what's the, the concept of the company? Sure. So we, we are building Proterra to, to create a, a more sustainable future through exploring applications for proteins that we haven't explored in the past, specifically in the food industry, to replace chemical additives that are produced on, on sustainable ways. And also some of those chemical additives that are unhealthy for, for people. So that, that's the, the vision of the company. That's why we, we are building Proterra. And we are oh. doing, we, we are achieving that, that vision by uh, using two core technologies uh, or artificial intelligence platform that we call MADI and also a uh, protein fermentation to produce the products that we are developing. So what are some of the additives that are problematic and uh, are they, do they tend to be proteins or can you replace them functionally with proteins that will do the same jobs as the additives? Exactly. So usually when, when people think about uh, proteins, proteins from a nutritional perspective, right? Like proteins from, from meat or, or protein from eggs or and more recently proteins from, from plants. But we see proteins from a functional perspective. Right? Like, for example, we are developing some proteins that have antifungal properties so we can extend shelf life in, in bakery applications, in bakery products like white bread, for example, replacing all the additives that are being used today. So th those are the kind of functionalities that we are exploring. And in terms of the additives that, that we are targeting to replace, we are looking at calcium propionate, for example, sorbates. We are also exploring to replace different texturizing agents like methyl cellulose that it's being used in, in most of the plant-based and meat alternatives, for example. And all these additives have two main problems. The, the first one is that they are not well perceived from the consumer perspective because they sound a chemical, right? So companies know that and, and companies know, food companies know that people, is, people are looking for what is called clean label, right? That, uh, that means ingredients that I can understand, that I can easily relate to, and that doesn't right. sound chemical. And that's very subjective, but then you have all the, the backstage regarding how those additives are being produced. Most of them are petrochemicals and, and are not sustainable. So that's why we are solving that problem with proteins that are very functional, right? They are produced through fermentation, which is a sustainable, a sustainable process. 
and doesn't have any impact on human health at all, right? Because we can digest proteins and, and we don't have problems with them. Well, how do you know that the you know each compound you create would not have an effect on human health? Do you have to test each one of them individually? Yeah. So in, indeed, what the the platform can do it's to predict the toxicity upfront, right? So we know upfront if certain proteins will have a, a negative impact. It will, it will if they will have uh, certain domains or structures that are linked to allergens or to other certain toxic proteins. Right? So we know that up front. And then the other way that we are clearing that part is that we are using proteins that are coming from sources that are safe to eat by humans, basically. Right. So we have, for example, hundreds of thousands of proteins that are coming from rice or other plant sources. And then we screen those proteins with our platform and we identify which one will have the function we are looking for. So that it helps us ensure that the protein will be safe to consume. Well, what are some of the functional groups that cause problems? I don't know if you know of a few names, like, you know, is it an aldehyde or an ester? Or, you know, what are the, some of the pro- problematic ones? And what are some of the uh, super inactive ones? Yeah, so one, one example, it's, uh, and this is one of the, the main products we are developing, it's to replace calcium propionate and sorbate in, in bakery applications. So sorbate and calcium propionate is being used to inhibit the growth of, of uh, mold, that uh, green mold that usually grows in, in white bread. So there are two problems there. One is from the consumer perspective, they perceive this as a chemical additive. So they are preferring products that don't have those type of additives. And the problem with the products that don't have those additives is that they last one week, probably. So we are generating too much waste uh, to produce those products. And in that case, we have developed a protein that we call Proteragard. That's our first product. And it's a, a protein that can extend shelf life of baked products up to 30 days. And, and this is a, a, a really interesting example for us because if we compare with the activity of the calcium propionate, which is our, our target to replace, it can only extend shelf life 15 days. So we are doubling the effect with a protein that it's well perceived from consumers and, and it, it's more active, right? So we are decreasing food waste by, by replacing this additive. So that's an amazing example on how proteins can outperform the, the other additives that we are using from a functional yeah. perspective and from a, from a sustainability perspective. You have to make sure, I guess, it doesn't affect taste or texture as well, right? Exactly. And and yeah, that, that's really important. And because the protein is so active, we only use a very small amount of the protein. So we, we are not impacting any any taste or any organoleptic problem. In this case, what's the problem with sorbates and what's the problem with uh, calcium propionate? Like what negative, is it just in the consumer's mind or do they actually have negative effects? So it is mostly in this case on, on, on a subject perception from, from consumers but also from, from the effect, right? Uh, sorbate and, and calcium propionate can be used up to certain amounts because it's, it's regulated by the FDA in the U.S. and by different organizations uh, around the globe. So it, it only provides 15 days shelf life extension. So you have two problems. One, from the consumer perspective, that they perceive it as a chemical additive, but also from, from food companies that they are looking for more to extend shelf life, long-term shelf life. 30 days or more to decrease food waste, basically. And sorbate and propionate doesn't provide that. They only provide up to 15 days and you need to be, to have very clean conditions in your uh, manufacturing plants to make sure that it won't get contaminated with fungal spore. So it's it, th- those are the main challenges for that. Yeah, that makes sense. Are there any uh, substances right now that are added to foods that are very problematic? that the food industry would love for you to, to replace and why? Exactly. In that case, we are looking at uh, some emulsifying components that are known to generate some uh, gastrointestinal problems, inflammation, um, especially it's a polysorbates. So there is more and more evidence that it's linked to, to um, some gastrointestinal problems. So food companies are looking to, to replace those. And, and obviously emulsifying properties it's something that we can find in proteins and but we don't have a product at the moment that it's uh, at the pilot scale in in that area it's more on the early development before we continue 
I've been personally funding the Finding Genius podcast for four and a half years now, which has led to 2,700 plus interviews of clinicians, researchers, scientists, CEOs, and other amazing people who are working to advance science and improve our lives and our world. Even though this podcast gets 100,000 plus downloads a month, we need your help to reach hundreds of thousands more worldwide. Please visit FindingGeniusPodcast.com and click on Support Us. We have three levels of membership from 10 to $49 a month, including perks such as the ability to see ahead in our interview calendar and ask questions of upcoming guests, transcripts of podcasts you're interested in, the ability to request specific topics or guests, and more. Visit FindingGeniusPodcast.com and click Support Us today. Now, back to the show. Are there any uh, unusual side effects or benefits that are unexpected from using the proteins? I mean, what, what's being interesting for us is to to identify new functions for, for proteins that are already known. And and that, that's super interesting to, to explore with, with the platform, right? So, for example, we have proteins in, in rice that are annotated to have certain function, like an enzymatic function to absorb glucose or to digest glucose. And then we find that certain domain of that protein, it's a really good emulsifying protein. So then we, we use that. It's like finding new applications for proteins that are already known. And that, that's uh, some you know, insight we, we have um, generated from, from using the, the platform. Then side effects, we haven't found any because the, the amounts of the protein we use are so low that, that we don't generate any extra side effect. And from the nutritional point of view, it's also a very small amount of proteins. So we're not adding extra amino acids or, or extra nutrients to the food. Yeah, that's cool. When you cook, though, don't you denature the proteins? Wouldn't you change their structure? Or, you know, do you design some that interlink and make like a crust, make the food better? I mean, what are some of the things you can do? Yeah, that, that's actually interesting, an interesting point, especially in, in our uh, protein for uh, bakery applications. One of the challenges was to how to find a protein that will resist the baking process because it needs to be added before you, you bake the product in the dough. So that, that was one of the challenges and one, what, that was one of the drivers for the, for the design of the protein. So it's, it resists the, the baking process, which are really high temperatures, but then can be easily digested by uh, enzymes in the stomach. So we need to find that balance to make sure we, we don't generate any you know, toxic side effect. Are there any um, unusual properties when you, when you cook with some of the proteins? Can some of them actually enhance the food? Again, like what if they, I don't know, cross-linked somehow and made a, a natural polymer that made the, the outside of some food like more crispy or crusty or something? Yeah, we, we are indeed also exploring some uh, texturizing proteins. And in that case, you need to find proteins that will generate that uh, that effect once you, you cook your, your food product. But that's also something that we are just recently starting to explore. And we are trying to understand how to, to simulate that and how to predict that right? from, from your native protein structure and then how the cooking process will change that structure to generate this, this uh, extra texture that, that uh, all the people is, is looking for. And then, I mean, proteins, I guess, can fold or come in unlimited configurations. How do you know how to make them from the constituent amino acids and how do you know what properties they'll have? In, in that case, as I mentioned, we, we are, our approach is to start from proteins that are already existing in nature. Otherwise, the problem is it's really hard to solve because you have virtually infinite protein sequences that can generate the one structure. So we, we screen these millions, hundreds of millions of protein sequences that we know that exist in nature. So then once we identify the, the protein that will have the properties we are looking for, we take the, the sequence and, and we encode that and we translate that information to a yeast. So then the yeast produce the protein. That's how we, we go from the computational design to an actual product. If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. Yeah, I guess you could scale up very quickly from there. You have a whole bunch of yeast in the right conditions, it would probably churn out tons and tons of protein very quickly, right? Exactly right. And that's the fermentation process. It's, it's technology well understood. So that's, that's exactly why we're using that to, to scale up. Um, since you're modeling these compounds, do you, is there any point in going back and modeling some of the compounds that are natively in the ingredients of bread? 
and seeing if a modification of one of those would uh, again change the the shelf life or other properties of the bread. Like, are you just going for shelf life, or are you going for other properties of these foods? It depends on the on the ingredient that we are developing. For example, the one that I mentioned that was only for for shelf life for and and for one dimension of shelf life, which is microbial contamination. That was very very specific problem. And what what we are actually doing with our platform is not to simulate the the environmental conditions because that takes too much time and too much computational power to do, and especially in systems that are really complex and have m- many, many different molecules interacting. Instead of doing that, what, what we have built, it's a platform that can predict how the protein will perform in that final application from the amino acid sequence and from the 3D structure and, and other features that are interesting for us in, from, from proteins. So then that's how we have trained the platform, right? So we we design some candidates, then we see the effect, we measure the effect on, on extending chocolate, then we provide feedback directly to the platform. So then the, the platform infers all those uh, variables that are playing in, in terms of interacting with other molecules and the matrix, et cetera, to then design better proteins. So we, we are not actually simulating the environment. I think it'd be cool if you could make a substance that, um, you know, someone gets it, but let's say someone adds salt to it when they're going to eat it at home and that changes the, uh, you know, interacts with the proteins and either makes a new flavor or changes the food somehow, you know, very quickly to be more palatable and more interesting. Any, any thoughts on adding something like that, that would change the food later on to make it again, more interesting to the person eating it. Exactly. Yes. That that's definitely something that it's, it's super interesting and we will see, a lot around that in, in the future of protein development as we understand how protein will, will play a role in the functionality of food. And we can see uh, something around that, especially with colors, for example, that you can design proteins that with in certain environments or pH conditions might change color. And that that's super interesting to, to explore. Then you also have textures. Right? Textures can change as you add different uh, compounds or, or you bake at different uh, temperatures, etc. So that's definitely how we see or the direction we see the proteins in, in the future of food. Yeah, I can see that um, it would be interesting later on, right, to, to create these effects in the food. Nutritionally, you said there's not a lot of protein maybe that will go into a particular food. But again, nutritionally, does this add or take away or change the nutritional content of foods? At least from the products we are developing at the moment, we we will not see a, a, a nutritional uh, eff- effect because the concentration is very low, right? So we we are not uh, in into that space. We are not aiming to uh, provide more protein content in bulk, so the product will be more nutritious. So how long do you think this will take till it gets to market, or is it in market right now? And what are some of the first products it will appear in? So for, for us at the moment, we are uh, scaling up and at I'll say pilot scale, producing these kilograms of product to sample with uh, our partners, basically food companies to test. And because they have the understanding on how this product must work in the final food product, they give us that feedback. So we are in that, in that iteration loop. So we expect to hit the market in, uh, by the end of 2022. Starting in, in Latin America first, and then in U.S. by 2023. Very cool. Um, any other applications that you see this could be used for, Leonardo? Now that you now that you're doing it, anything, uh, any tweaks? Yes, we. I mean, we, we do have a, a lot of new product development in in our pipeline. Obviously, we have limited resources, so we need to make sure we focus on on one specific product first, and then start deploying other applications. But uh, we are super interested about exploring texture, as I mentioned, emulsification properties, foaming properties of food. Then you have colors that are also something really interesting, especially in in plant-based meats, right, where you need to provide that color for for the flexitarians, right? People that will transition from eating meat to a plant-based alternative if if you have the, the right organoleptic properties. So those are areas that we are really excited about. Well, very good. Uh, Leonardo, what's the best way for people to find out more about Proterra? Where can they go? Yeah, so we have our, our, all the information in our website at uh, proterrabio.com and also our Instagram account, uh, proterrabio, and LinkedIn and Twitter. 
Well, Leonardo, it's very cool. If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. You've been listening to the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. If you like what you hear, be sure to review and subscribe to the Finding Genius Podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. And want to be smarter than everybody else? Become a premium member at FindingGeniusPodcast.com. This podcast is for information only. No advice of any kind is being given. Any action you take or don't take as a result of listening is your sole responsibility. Consult professionals when advice is needed.